Good morning, everyone. I'm Jackie Davidoff, principal of Davidoff Strategy and co-chair of Chicago Women in Philanthropy, along with Deborah Walker Johnson. I want to note that there is closed captioning available and directions for that. So we are here because we have work to do. And it's going to take intention and vision and community. With the full partnership of Chicago Foundation for Women, this is the first step in a movement to make real change in how philanthropy recognizes and supports women and girls, especially of color, in our city. This program came about because CWIP was seeking to move more deeply into our vision, our vision to creating an equitable, inclusive, and connected social sector. And we recognized that we needed to step up in our leadership of this. And so with that, we reached out to our sister partner organization, Chicago Foundation for Women, to join forces as they are working powerfully to realize a world in which all women and girls have the opportunity to thrive in safe, healthy, and just communities. And so of all the ways that we felt that we could combine forces, the Ms. Foundation Report Pocket Change was the genesis for this program, this convening, for the start of a localized response to their work to make change in shifting the philanthropic landscape to address a disproportionate funding gap, as we will hear a lot more about. So before I close, I wanna shout out to the six participating organizations that have joined us in this effort. The Baumhart Center, Axelson Center for Nonprofit Management, Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago, the Chicago Community Trust, Davidoff Strategy, Elevate and Healthy Communities Foundation. Thank you so much for stepping up. And now we'll hear from Deborah to set us up for what's to come. Thanks, Jackie. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Deborah Walker Johnson, and I'm president of the Forest Preserve Foundation and board co chair for Chicago Women in Philanthropy. As Jackie stated, this event was inspired by the Ms. Foundation report pocket change. I hope you all have had a chance to read it. The report highlighted many of the funding gaps faced by organizations serving women and girls and those led by women of color. Even as these organizations receive less funding, resources, and overall support, women of color continue to be at the forefront of major grassroots movements from suffragism, civil rights, criminal justice, farm workers' rights, fair wages for domestic workers, Me Too, and Black Lives Matter. So how can we take this report and make it actionable? This collaboration between Chicago Foundation for Women and Chicago Women in Philanthropy is the first step towards shifting the philanthropic landscape for women and girls of color. We are honored to host this conversation between Felicia Davis, President and CEO of Chicago Foundation for Women, and Teresa Younger, CEO and President of the Ms. Foundation, to talk more about the Pocket Change Report and where we are today. But before introducing Felicia and Teresa, we will be launching a poll to hear from you about the topics we will discuss today. So the first question is, when you think of women and girls of color, whom do you think is represented? Okay. Do we have our next poll up? One second, I'm launching the first, the second poll, one second. Thank you, Deborah. So we have a lot of direct service nonprofits here. Uh, let's see, 18% are private or family community foundation. 6% are corporate social responsibility groups and 22% are others. Okay. 
Okay, now we have our poll. So when you think of women and girls of color, whom do you think is represented? Okay. So then our next question is according to Giving USA 2018, a total of 66.9 billion was given by foundations in the United States. Of this total, how much philanthropic given was made to women and girls of color in 2017? Okay, so thank you. So we'll have the correct answer for all of you um, during the conversation, but thank you for participating in the poll. Your feedback is important to help us define our starting points to help determine the results to be achieved and expectations to be met or even exceeded. Okay, so now it is my pleasure to introduce our fe featured speakers. Felicia Davis is a self-described girl from the South Side. Me too, Felicia. She is deeply committed to community through inclusive services to others. As president of, and CEO of Chicago Foundation for Women, she leads their strategic efforts in investing in women and girls as catalysts, building stronger communities for all. Welcome, Felicia. Then next, Teresa C. Younger is an activist, advocate, renowned public speaker, organizational strategist, and a proven leader in the philanthropic and policy sectors. Having spent over 20 years on the front lines of some of the most critical battles for comprehensive equity and the elimination of institutionalized oppression, she now serves as president and CEO of the Ms. Foundation for Women. Welcome, Teresa. And so with that, Welcome, Felicia. I mean, Hi. Teresa. And Hello. so with that, I will turn it over to you, Felicia. Teresa, thank you. Hello, Hi. everyone. Thank you for being here today. I want to get right into it. And I am so deeply honored to have Teresa on the virtual stage here today um, to talk about her work, but this, you know, pivotal body of research that you've put together. Um, you know, we know that Black women and girls live at intersecting um, um, compound multiple systems of oppression. And so this is really important. And I'd like, actually like to start because at the outset of the report, you all spent a good deal of time really talking about what it means to say women of color and what it means to say women of color led. So I wanted to start there as a, as a jumping off point. Sure, sure. First off, thank you so much. It's always uh, so wonderful to be in community and in relationship with you, Felicia. So I'm thrilled to be here and virtually with all of you in Chicago. You have been so incredibly generous, the Chicago community, in, in, in looking at Ms. And, and being in partnership with us. So I just want to lift that up. Uh, it's really been amazing and wonderful. So yes, you are correct. Uh, you know, the process by which we got to the report uh, of pocket change was one that included our board, included our staff. And one of the realities, because our staff is incredibly diverse as, as well as our board, was this conversation about who are we talking about when we say women and girls of color. And we wanted to be explicit about that because we wanted to recognize that we were not just talking about Black women. The assumption was because I was a Black and Indigenous woman that when I said women of color, I was talking about Black women. And when I, what I wanted to make sure that we understood was that when we are talking about women and girls of color, we are talking about women in the AAPI community, the Black community, the Hispanic community, the Indigenous community. We are talking about um, uh, gender non-conforming and transgender folks. We are talking about, for us, girls were not you know, three, four, five, six, seven, but girls were um, 12 and up to 25. So we, we were very intentional about that. But one of the things that we should recognize is as we talk to our partners in the field, 
many women of color do not define themselves as women of color. And many girls of color do not define themselves as girls of color. They define themselves as black women, as indigenous women, as you know, trans folks, like however they define. We are using the term women of color, women and girls of color as a political entity and power that is moving things forward. And so I think that's really important that we don't you know, use the term and have it supersede what we're really saying. So if you're going to say it, explain who you're talking about, um, be very clear about who you're talking about. And we have done that in the front of the report. And we talk to the challenge of what this terminology really is. Uh, but we're using it because we wanted this report to seen as, be seen as a power building conversation. And, uh, and that was a way for us to unify that conversation. Teresa, I thank you for that answer. And I wanna um, connect something you've just said to the work that you and I both do in different geographies, um, but we lead storied um, institutions, um, um, women's foundations or women's funds, so storied institutions. And we happen to be at this moment, intersectional leaders who have identities. Primarily, I identify myself as a black woman. And so when you said, because when you say women of color, the assumption is that you're only talking about black women. So what I would like, and, and, and happens to me as well, over here in Chicago at Chicago Foundation for Women, so for the foundations, for the corporate entities in the room and the nonprofits in the room, for people who are, for donors, supporters, can you talk a little bit about the importance there and why it's really powerful for us to, as, a, as support when black leaders are, I'm a black leader, but when I say women of color, understand that I am including the full spectrum as are you and why we should all be including the full spectrum and not just assume that because that's my, intersectional identity, it's the only extent of who I'm talking about. Well, you know, I love conversations with you, Felicia, because I get to be really honest. So I will say to the audience today, I don't have really good filters. I turned 50 a couple of years ago, so they're all gone. Um, but <laughs> one of the things I want to just lift up is that when white women were talking about women of color or black women, nobody assumed that they, uh, that they didn't have any uh, leverage or couldn't talk about those communities. And so now that we see more black women and women of color in leadership, and I say both black and women of color in leadership, there's this question about how can we be talking about other people too? And it is because we understand and do have some shared experiences uh, across board that we can talk about it. And so, you know, one of the things that we found in our report, uh, as well as in many other reports, um, was that women of color in leadership uh, get to define who they are, but oftentimes can, uh, external audiences define who we are. So I get to walk on a stage, I get to define myself as a black woman and an indigenous woman, but that does not negate the experiences in my life, which are truly intersectional. So when I say women of color, I am speaking to my sister who is Korean and my other sister who is black and Japanese and my you know, best friends who are, right? Quote unquote, who are. Um, and so what is really critical is that we not just make assumptions about who is in front of us, but understand the complexities of their lives and the complexities of their communities. And we can't know what that is until we're in deep relationship with people. And so that's why it's so important. And when you're dealing in a corporate setting or you're dealing in a nonprofit setting, the question that we have to decide is how deep a relationship are we willing to go to understand who we're talking with? And um, how are we, how uncomfortable are we willing to be and to make other people in this process of hosting a conversation around targeted efforts? You know, that's, it reminds me of something I thought um, for a while, um, and a colleague in Chicago has said this, the question that we have to ask ourselves coming back to philanthropy, you know, philanthropy wasn't created for women of color. 
And um, we have a growing body, as you said, of women um, who are leading in philanthropy and women of color and black and women of color who are leading the philanthropy, but it wasn't created for us. So we have this moment, philanthropy has this moment where it could really stand up um, and, you know, kind of like reach the, the fullness of, of, of our collective potential. And the question is what um, philanthropy rules are we willing to break, right, to make this happen? So right. the report highlights many barriers of philanthropic funding for women of color led organization and their experiences. Why do you think that there is this, um, this gap? And in the, in the survey that we just did, um, the correct answer, you all, was um, 365 million out of that 60 um, plus billion dollars. So Teresa, why do you think that is? Well, it's not even my opinion. We actually know that, um, that, that folks are not funding women of color. There is a broken trust factor. This unconscious bias that gets played into the funding community about who should get money, what validates that money, and, um, and how those dollars are spent. So one of the things that we know about philanthropy, and you hit this on the head, philanthropy was not, uh, was, was see charity. And so it was not designed for us or by us. And so philanthropy in and of itself developed a, a set of rules. It said, we will fund X if it presents this in the end, and we want those results done in a year, two years. Um, what we are talking about when we talk about the report and how philanthropy has funded, philanthropy is a fickle friend. And even as I sit in the middle of it, it is a fickle friend. We do not stay with a topic generationally, and we are using a capitalistic model to impact movement building, change, and feminism. And we have to like take a step back from that. So what we know is, you know, people always thought that, you know, uh, women of color, they can't handle that kind of money. You know, it's going to get embezzled. They, they don't have time for that, right? Or we make an assumption as funders, their budget is so small, how can they even, have, what would they do with this? Or we make the assumption that direct service isn't about movement building or building power. And I think we have to look at what are the systemic factors, call them out and lift them up. Misogyny, white supremacy, sexism, racism, all the, the isms go on and on and on. We break those out in the report as well as in our strategic plan. But you have to actually identify those and recognize that we are talking about generational change. And when philanthropy says we're going to fund you this year and then you write us a report and then we're going to fund you next year and we're going to write you're going to write us a report, we are not actually building long term deep relationships with our partners. And so you have women, particularly women of color, who are working on the grassroots, trying to get their work done, who are constant, who are understaffed and underpaid most of the time, um, who are trying to write a report so that it pleases you. And they're being asked to, to track numbers, not impact over time. And so there are some things that philanthropy is going to have to do over time. The other reality is that philanthropy has been very um, skittish about being explicit about who they want to fund. So they say, we're going to fund youth. And look at all these youth we funded. No, if you want to fund girls, fund girls. Define what girl is for you and then define girl, fund girls. If you want to fund women of color, it is not exclusive of anybody else. In the pool of inequality, there are a lot of folks. And so what we did at the Ms. Foundation said, in the pool of inequality, there are lots of folks. For us, we have a tiny pebble of dollars to drop. We're gonna drop it over women and girls of color and let the ripple of that impact all of the other communities that are in this pool. You know what, so, and in the report, you talk about, this is your uh, one of your mantras, you have many, you know, uh, name it, right? Name it, track it, and increase it. Yes. Um, and so naming who it is, and I, and I do, I talk to peers in philanthropy, you know, when um, proposals are going out, there is still the skittishness about using, saying that this is about black women or mm -hmm. this is about Latina girls. Or, and, 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 you know, cause sometimes, you know, being politically correct, women of color can, can, can um, hide a lot of sins, right? You could say, oh, we've, we've given $500 million and, yeah. and, and funding to women of color. And when you look at the details, 
um, you might see some gaps that are really crucial in our communities. And so that part about naming it and then tracking it, I think, you know, your call out to all of us um, is, is really important. So I have the pleasure of knowing you and I've had the opportunity to, to, to see you um, in other spaces, the Women's Funding Network, when we actually did in-person conferences, you know, back then. <laughs> And, way back then. <laughs> way back then, and to hear you talk. But when you first got to Ms., because you do a lot of work nationally, but I know you're a really sincere leader when it comes to supporting what's going on locally as well. But what can we learn? Tell us, um, tell me and tell us, when you did this national listening tour at the beginning of your tenure at the Ms. Foundation, what, what came to the fore for you? Yeah, it was it was an amazing uh, opportunity that I got to to go around the com- country, and I stopped in Chicago as one of my stops. I traveled about eighty to ninety thousand miles in a year, uh, so just within the United States. And the things that we heard were consistent across the board. We heard from women of color leaders that could not retire because they had not paid themselves enough to get money out of Social Security, and their nonprofits were so small that they weren't able to help with a pension uh, fund. And many in philanthropy were not funding that. They were not funding general operating support. They were funding projects that look bright and shiny. And, uh, And that kept coming up to the forefront. We also heard comments and considerations around, you know, folks who said, you know, People don't want to talk about feminism or intersectionality or the complexities of our work. Uh, And so, you know, I took that in as I was listening to folks also. And we heard from many, uh, many of the groups that we were stopping with and talking with about how hard it was to find the dollars that were out there. So, you know, even though, just as you said, even though philanthropy was saying, yes, we're making all these grants. These nonprofit leaders were not able to find it because there was no explicit place for them to go. And then they were being asked to report back things that weren't actually impacting their communities. Uh, And and the the last thing I will say that I heard on that listening tour that we were able to implement in a strategic plan and thus has come out in pocket change, which is uh, they were saying to us, the philanthropic sector only wants to fund in X. So they're gonna only fund reproductive justice or leadership after school or whatever it was. And we have to break out of those silos of how we are asking folks to uh, about how they're doing their work. Because one of the things we found in pocket change, which just got lifted up, is that many of the grassroots organizations were using multiple issues and multiple strategies to do their work. They were using direct service to get people in the door, to be able to provide the service, to then build the power. And the the thing that was most interesting to me in my listening to her was also this uncomfortable ability of philanthropy to truly be willing to give up power to the grassroots and trust the leadership that is on the ground. Teresa, I, I really think that this, so everyone listening, this is a really powerful calling in opportunity for us. Um, a couple of, just yesterday, um, CFW with um, Woods Fund and Crossroads Fund and the Chicago Community Trust, um, we have a women's leadership development um, program for nonprofit women of co- leaders in the um, women of color in the nonprofit space. And, you know, one of the things that came out in the session was just how exhausted they are because of all these things that you're talking about, yeah. right? Yeah. And it, 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 it troubles me, right? It, it, it bothers me. We've had people um, stand up. We were at a convening once. Someone stood up and said exactly what you just said. She's a local leader in Chicago that has done amazing work, started an organization, first arts organization, first in her home, and has grown to a community center, yeah. a charter school. And, right? and she said she had recruited a young woman to who said, well, the young woman said, I want to do this. I want to succeed when you, when you leave. Yeah. And she said, I can't do that to her. I don't even have retirement. And so when it comes to funding, it seems as if, especially for organizations that are led by, that women of color led, we're fine with them being on the struggle bus. We sent these women out and nonprofits into a global pandemic, many of them without own, without their own health care, mm-hmm. many of them without uh, sick leave, 
and, mm -hmm. and being able to take care of themselves. And that's not just, it's not equitable. It's also not moral. I'm, I'm not to play the moral card, but it's also not moral. We are asking these organizations, these grassroots organizations to really lead and um, serve in our communities and we withhold funding from, from them. And later we can talk about that because I have long said that, you know, the larger and more well-resourced an organization is, the more likely the leader of that organization is to be a white male. And we have yes, some data, yes. we're, gonna, we're gonna come back to that um, and talk about it in a, in, a, in a little bit. So your report has been out for a little while yeah. um, and it has some really great action steps that we can all take. And this is what this conversation is today. This is about draw, drawing a line in the sand for Chicago and saying, we want to do better. We can, we have the resources. I hope we have the commitment in this room and in other spaces that people, and when y'all hear this tape later, that we have the commitment, but we can absolutely do this. So it's been out for a while. What are some of the things that you've heard um, some nonprofits and funders are already implementing to increase funding? And a couple of things you mentioned about general operating support and some other things. Can you talk about those? Sure, sure. So the report's been out for a year and it, it's been fascinating to see how it has been used and how people are leveraging the report. A couple of things. The report, because it breaks down, that, that $356 million number is a half a percent of all philanthropic dollars. It is on average $5.48. Wait, let me say that again. $5.48 per woman and girl of color in this country per year. Not per day, not per month, per year. And so the way we have been, we have encouraged the nonprofit sector to use this is to break down the data. And the data, it can be broken down. We, we presented the report so that, uh, and, and put the data together so that it can be replicated locally and regionally. And I know we're going to get into that in a moment. We also put the report together so that it, um, in the regional numbers, people could have a conversation about what that looks like for them. So if you're in the South, $2.22, $2.22. If And we have it broken down by state. So you can follow this data. So what this has been able to do is it has for the nonprofit sector, allowed them to have the data that says we are not invested in enough and we need to be invested in more succinctly. And it recognizes the multi-issue, multiple strategies that they use, and it's a, a credibility relationship. And we interviewed, just so people know, over a thousand, we sent surveys out to over a thousand nonprofits, well, more than that, but we got a, over a thousand back in. So these are not, this is not just us speculating, this is actual data. What we are seeing from the uh, women's funding community predominantly, but also in many other places, uh, folks using this and, and asking themselves the question, what does it mean to be women of color led? What does it mean to, to support women of color led organizations? If an organization has a woman of color in leadership and an all white board and all white staff, that is not women of color led. So we need to ask ourselves the question, what is power? How are we willing to give it up? What does trust look like? So within philanthropy, we have to start asking ourselves those questions. And, you know, there are a number of times I'm sitting, Ms. Foundation is like, uh, is like Chicago, we raise our own dollars, right? And I will have a funder sit in front of me and tell me how much they care about women of color leadership and then not give a dollar to the Ms. Foundation because they do not recognize that in our organization itself, we're women of color and we are women of color led and our board is reflective of that and how we make our grants is reflective of that. So it's really important that you look at the boards of what they're doing. And when philanthropy is going back, can you de-silo how you're doing your grant making? What does that look like? How are you willing to have conversations within your institution that are critical? And where, how are you moving money to general operating support? And how are you being explicit about what you're doing? I know that sounds like all over the place, but in reality, if you're going to talk the talk, you have to walk the walk. And one of the things that we are seeing is in Ohio, uh, the, they have taken our report and decided to set dollars aside to do multi-year funding outside of their general strategy, multi-year funding for women of color leaders in their community. In Colorado, they have started a girls fund explicitly for girls of color and most of those are, are Latina girls. 
um, because that is the growing population in their community. In New Mexico, they are establishing conversations and strategies around healing justice as part of their uh, of, as part of their grant making because they recognize that women of color who are coming into leadership and running these organizations also need to work on healing because when we come into organizations, we are doing it with oftentimes our own driven lived experiences to change things. And so, you know, we're seeing these opportunities across the board. Also, the movement towards general operating support grants. Um, and, and looking at what we are challenging uh, private philanthropy to do is to look at intermediaries like Chicago Women's Foundation, like Ms. Foundation, like other community foundations, et cetera, around the country. And instead of deciding they need to set something up themselves, use the expertise where the relationships are. I mean, I could go on and on because uh, we are seeing this tick off in so many ways. Uh, and folks are reading into the report and into the work they wanna do. Um, something that we hope they will be able to implement within their own institutions. And we're gonna come back and you know, update these numbers. Uh, and you know, we've seen an uptick in dollars going to women and girls of color, going to folks of color um, because of last summer and where we are with the social uprising, which I'm, I, I think we still need to have it. But um, I think you know, there's so much going on. But the question is, will we invest long-term Will we invest for generational change in, and address the systemic problems? And are we willing to be to let those on the ground come up with the answers to help and heal their communities and not push down solutions to them? Teresa, these are all great um, provocative interrogating questions for our um, everyone here today as we move into our breakout sessions. And I wanted to highlight something that you just said, particularly about women's funds as or women's foundations as intermediaries. I mean, I have this conversation, I know you do too, have this <laughs> conversation all the time. And it's like, I wanna pick your brain and I wanna talk about this and blah, 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 blah. And it, one of the things that it's really, I think it's really important for folks to understand, especially when you talk about the way that people do silo grant making. Our core, the core issue areas for Chicago Foundation for Women are access to healthcare and healthcare information freedom from gender-based violence, and economic security and opportunity for women. All those three, three things are linked. If you're an mm -hmm. econ economic mm -hmm. security uh, funder, if that's what you believe, oh, I only want to do workforce, do you understand then that access to health care and health information helps with economic security? Exactly. Do you understand that freedom from gender-based violence helps with that these things, you can't decouple a woman is not one dimensional. Her life is not one dimensional. Our communities are not one dimensional. And then the other thing that you highlighted before we go into the breakout sessions, and I, I spent, you know this, I spent the bulk of my um, career in the public sector. And so I have a healthy critique for government as I do for philanthropy, because they mm -hmm. do this in the same way. Mm -hmm. Going into a neighborhood or a community or a space or whatever and saying, oh, coming in, oh, we're gonna fund this thing, whatever this thing is, and then being surprised that in a year you didn't solve poverty when the conditions that created the poverty to begin, you wanted it for your report. The people in those communities want it for their lives. Exactly. They want it for, so, so, all right, y'all, now that we got you fired up, I think I'm supposed to turn y'all into, um, I'm supposed to introduce Carrie and Rochelle. Um, I want to invite Carrie Miner and Rochelle Bennett to join us in this conversation. Carrie serves as the Director of Leadership Giving at Make the Challenge, a nonprofit dedicated to developing youth to be empowered, informed, and active citizens who will promote a just and equitable society. In this role, Carrie is responsible for building a community of individual donors and raising funds to help scale the organization's reach and impact. Rochelle is a solo staff member of AmeriCares based in Chicago, working with major donors across the Midwest. She also manages the, their uh, AmeriCares Chicago Council and collaborates with local strategic partners. AmeriCares saves lives and improves health for people affected by poverty or disaster around the world. Carrie and Rochelle have done research on women of color leaders, the funding of women of color led organizations, the funding they receive, and the demographics of nonprofit leadership in Chicago. So welcome, uh, Carrie and Rochelle, and can you walk us through your findings? Yes, thank you so much for the warm introduction, Felicia and Teresa and the team at the Miss Foundation for all of your hard work on the pocket change report that helped drive 
our research here today. Uh, Rochelle and I are so excited to be included in this dynamic conversation about shifting the philanthropic landscape for women of color here in Chicago. And we're eager to share a little bit about what we learned as we explored some local data with the help of Forefront Chicago. Thanks to Forefront, if you aren't already a member, definitely check them out for amazing tools and resources. I know this was already very well stated and explained by Teresa, but I want to flag again that we'll be using the term women of color in this presentation. We recognize the complexity and intersectionality of identity and this terminology is not perfect, but it is a starting place for us. Um, so next and to begin, we found that there is a lot that we don't know and don't have data for here in Chicago. We don't have comprehensive local data about how many organizations are run by women of color in Chicago, although we can make some anecdotal assumptions that there has been a focus on hiring women of color into leadership positions in the nonprofit space over time, over the last few years, like Felicia and Teresa were just talking about. We recommend that nonprofits, foundations, and other social sector organizations start tracking and reporting demographic information of their leadership, board, and staff so that together we can gather this data. GuideStar is actually a really great place to start. They have a relatively new DEI center, which is a good place um, to report this data as many nonprofits are already self-reporting their data there. We also learned some pretty powerful statistics from the Candid Foundation database. In Chicago, organizations that state that they specifically serve women and girls or based on race and ethnicity only receive a half of 1% of all foundation funding in 2017 and 2018. I just wanna repeat that. Nonprofit organizations that serve women and girls or based on race and ethnicity only receive half of 1% of all foundation funding. This is on par with what was found nationally via the pocket change report driven by the Miss Foundation, which you all should have access to and I encourage you to read it. We'll put a link there in the chat. A few things to note about this data. The 2019 and 2020 data is not available, mainly due to tax record and data keeping by the government, which was slowed due to the pandemic. Second, nonprofits must specifically state that they serve these populations to be included in this count. The numbers may be slightly higher, but even then, this is a staggering statistic that shows we, there's tremendous room for improvement. Uh, Teresa will be sharing some amazing recommendations from the Pocket Change Report in just a moment, but before we do that, we wanted to share another staggering piece of data that we found. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rochelle to share that. Thanks, Carrie. Um, and so this graph that we're looking at comes from the Center for Effective Philanthropy. It shows um, demographic information of leaders in the nonprofit sector across the country by gender and race, recognizing that gender naming um, is not perfect. So this tells us that as budgets of the nonprofit organization grows, the number of women of color and men of color at the top decline significantly. As Felicia noted earlier, it also shows that the only a small percentage of organizations are run by women of color. Um, and so this leads to some of the recommendations that we make in the following slides. And so I'm not sure if um, Felicia or Teresa wanna jump in for any of these recommendations. Yes, yes. Thank you. Teresa, welcome back um, into the room. Uh, we touched on this a little bit. Carrie and Rochelle, thank you so much. Um, and I, want, I just do have a quick question for you, Teresa. Are you surprised at what the local data says when you um, compare it or contrast it to the national data? I am not surprised. I mean, what, you know, what reports do, and I just want to lift this up, it, it just amplifies and um, solidifies what we already know to be true. There is not, uh, if you ask any nonprofit leader, if you ask any woman of color leader, you wouldn't have to do a report on it. We know there are very few dollars going to women of color led organizations, and we know that their budgets are smaller. So if the average grant going to uh, women or women led organizations, let's just say was $50,000, the amount going to women of color led organizations was significantly less. So uh, in the report itself, we say that the average dollars going to women led organizations with $35,000, 
the uh, amount of grant dollars going to women of color led organizations was $15,000. So, you know, I'm not surprised and I'm really appreciative of the data research that was done. We use strength in numbers to do our report. Um, and we were very, because I also have a background in po public policy like you, Felicia, I wanted to make sure the report could stay alive and could be replicated over time. I, that was so thoughtful. So we, um, on the screen, I think everyone is still seeing some of the recommendations and we wanted to highlight a couple of things. I mean, this report, if you haven't read it again, we've put it in the chat a few times, please do. And there are um, summaries or executive summaries, really, if you're interested in specific demographics, I think you all have done a really stellar job of breaking it out so that you can get, and you can say, well, what does this look like for Latino girls and or Latinx girl and women, girls and women and so forth and so on. So thank you for doing that work. And, and we know that there is a uh, a dearth of data in, in many instances, but you did, and, and Carrie and Rochelle also did a great job of, of, of pulling this together. Um, being mindful of the identity of organizational leaders and decision makers. And so that speaks to who, you know, boards of directors are hiring, but it also speaks to the composition of boards and, and directors. We know this, so let's just think about this, y'all. I've served on board and, and this is just how it goes a lot of times. If you have 20 lawyers on your board, and you need someone else on the board and say there are 20 white male lawyers on the board and you're like, oh, we need another board member. Who are they likely to reach out to? Perhaps another white male lawyer. And so that you have to be really intentional about um, that diversity. At Chicago Foundation for Women, and we put this on the slide, we use this in our grant making and our guidelines. And you'd be surprised, you would be surprised. We have women and our name as a foundation but you'd be surprised with how many um, organizations apply for grants. And we look at their board composition because we ask them for the board demographics and you no know, women are on the board. And there is a, there is a, a nonprofit in Chicago, I won't say the name, um, we gave them this feedback. And, we, and so let's just be clear, we gave them the feedback. We already know that their staff had already been giving them their, this feedback. They're a youth serving organization. They serve lots of youth of color. They're located on the West Side of Chicago. So Teresa, that's predominantly black and Latinx communities on the West Side of Chicago. And yet their board had no um, um, reflective diversity. And so when we turned them down for a grant, we had that conversation with them. To their credit, they did the work, but certainly our I don't, know, I don't know what gave them that moment, what really solidified it for them. But again, we were just echoing what I'm sure their staff had already said to them. So some of our, our diversity guidelines are 50% of staff leadership identify as woman, trans, or gender non-binary. 40% of board members identify as a woman, trans, gender non-binary. 33% of staff leadership identify as a person of color. And 25% of board members identify as persons of color. And this is where we stand today, we continue to reflect and think about what our communities, um, um, how our communities are composed and collect the data. But our most powerful tool for seeing change is to use those grant funds, not just our grant funds, but that's really powerful. We could also use, you know, where we're investing our dollars and, and, and where we're buying our goods and services. So for other founda foundations, thinking about how can we start the conversation about diversifying our board. Teresa, have you um, had this conversation with others and what what do you say to this? So, you we know, can't find anybody there. Yeah, um, you know, a couple a couple of a couple of things that I would just lift up. One of the things I, I want to just share this quick story. We made grants and Chicago Women's Foundation was one of those two women's funds that uh, we felt were doing critical work around women and girls of color and who were being led or intentional about those efforts. We went to, uh, it was a $25,000 grant. You all were able to match it with $25,000. In one year, we moved an additional half a million dollars to women and girls of color based on those matching grants. At one point, we went to one foundation, I won't say who it was, and we offered them this grant and their board came back and said, no, you will not tell us what we need to do. And so they would not take our money, they would not match our money, and the CEO of that foundation had to go through a whole conversation with them. Uh, and one of the things that we have found is it's not just how diversified your board is, it's also where those leaders are in the leadership of the organization. 
we have women of color who are the, our treasurers, who are our board chairs. They're not just sitting around the table, but we ask this question so that we can enter into a conversation. And believe me, we just uh, made grants, a million dollar grants to the South in our new Mid-South strategy. In that strategy, we too had folks, we were explicit, women and girls of color, a multi-issue intersectional organization, feminist approach. We had, were very clear in what we were trying to do. And we still got proposals from um, folks who would say, well, we're trying to do it, but our you know, chair, our vice chair and our, and our CEO are all white men. And we were like, that's, that's not getting us there. So you know, we are seeing this. I have been very intentional also at the NIST Foundation to diversify our board. We are a second wave white feminist organization and institution, and we needed, and we had been working towards this, but we needed to be intentional about it. And so the board made very distinctive decisions. You can write into your bylaws, or you can have common practice around what your diversity recommendations are. And what I challenge people to do is to not just say diversity are women because we see this in predominantly in the finance field, they go, oh, we're diverse, we have half, half our board is women, but they might have only one woman of color. So the thing you have to do is to look at how are you bringing on cohorts of, of folks of color onto your board? What kinds of roles are you putting them in? Are you being explicit about the leadership you hope that they will take on one day? And, and, and asking them to come on board because of their own lived experience to add to the dynamics of the conversation. Yeah, I think that's really important. We, um, one other thing, and we can share this if anyone is interested in the report out. Um, when I started at CFW to add additional diversity to the board, we created this demographic survey that included, you, 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 your mantra about name it, right? Like name it, track it. We are making an assumption. So we asked people the geography of where they resided. We asked people, what their expertise is, what they professionally do, but we also ask them about networks and other things. And this was a way for us to better understand what we had on our board, what we had represented. And for a women's fund who we believe and we support, it's part of you know every talk that we give and part of all of our documents about trans and non-binary individuals. And then we didn't have any of that representation on our board. And so we were really intentional these last two board classes and we had big gaps, no one in education, at all. No one in community development or community organizing at all. No one on the west side of Chicago. I was the only staff member who lived on the south side of Chicago. We had people in the south suburbs, right? And so we, so not staff or board on the west side. So we had these big gaps. But what that gave us was a tool to then recruit more effectively. So we're not just looking for, we're looking for someone who has these types of experiences because we want our board to really reflect the full diversity of like lived experiences so that when we're having these conversations, it matters. They are able to participate and contribute and help guide the foundation from all of the um, all um, um, intersections, right? That we have a voice and we have some visibility and representation from all. And also grantee, we added a grantee to a grantee organization to our board. Um, and there's another question, Teresa, about, I think earlier in the chat, someone asked about um, what are some of the ways that you can, I think, democratize grant making. One of the things that we do often, I don't sit on committees. I don't sit on review committees for, and it was, it made a lot of waves, Teresa, and y'all, all y'all, people were like, oh my gosh, she's not interested in, and that wasn't it. The power dynamic is too great to overcome. If I sit on this panel, but not on that panel, and they get the funding, and they don't get the funding, then it's like, oh, that's because the CEO was on their review panel. So I don't do it. We disperse it. We use um, members of our community as reviewers. We have given, you know that we have given councils and circles. Um, we use those members, our community members. We have, our, our program committee is composed of members of the community at large, not just board members. Actually, in some committees, we have to rebalance because we have more people from the community on our, on our committees than we had actual board members. And so those are some of the ways that foundations can, that question about how we give away power. Are there other things, Carrie, Rochelle, are there other, Teresa, other ways in which foundations can really um, decentralize that power? Yeah, you know, one of the things that we did uh, in, in our grant making, because we're national and there's a level of expertise that needs to come to the table in many ways, was we asked our partners to recommend folks 
who should receive these grants. We did open proposal strategies so that we could uh, have people, you know, we could review what was going on. We also, we are at the Ms. Foundation in partnership with so many other foundations that we say, here's the list of who we have heard from and we share that list. Right. Here's who's where. Here's here's who we're funding. Uh, you know, how might you fund them? We talk about building collaborations in all of those ways. The other thing I want to lift up is it's not just the board. We have this conversation about the intersection of race and gender and what we are trying to do with our staff. We do the analysis with our vendors. It is a determination about our investment policy. We, I say at this point, we are 100 percent aligned. And you, you know, you could talk to our office manager and she would be able to tell you the same thing as our investors, right? So, you know, really looking at all of those levels. But, you know, Rochelle and Carrie may have some other suggestions, so I'll be quiet now. <laughs> um, I can chime in. And I think uh, what you all said is amazing. And the only thing that I will add from the someone who sits on a nonprofit side is really just, again, emphasizing that we need to state uh, like the name and track the data. And there are places to do that that will allow us to make this point. We shouldn't have to. Teresa and Felicia mentioned that most people are aware of this problem, but if we have the data behind it, we can start moving the needle as a nonprofit landscape in Chicago. And so again, I would point everyone to GuideStar as a starting place, um, but there are a number of ways. And the first step is to really start naming and tracking at your own organization and encourage the other nonprofit professionals uh, to do the same. I would just look up, sorry, Rochelle, really quickly. The Grant Makers for Girls of Color um, is looking at tracking data also. And we have been at the Ms. Foundation working with them. I would watch in the next three to six months for the recommendations on how to track da data that's consistent within all organizations or within all of philanthropic institutions. So I just, I, I lift that up because this is an ongoing conversation of the, of the track it, name it, track it, and then increase it. Sorry, Rochelle, I'll just stop. Not at all, that was perfect. I was actually gonna nudge us along um, to the breakout rooms, but I just wanted to say one, if anyone had one last thing they wanted to add before we, we push forward, you guys, we good? Okay, so just a quick slide about the breakout rooms and we can um, explain more once you're in there, but we hope to get maybe about 20, 25 minutes um, and have smaller groups to really continue these conversations. I think, as I said earlier, I hope we're fired up um, about all this information now. So you will have a facilitator in each room, um, but just wanted to kind of give you an overview. And then before we had, I think Jackie's gonna say more about that, but Carrie and I just wanted to say one more thanks um, to everyone, including us in this, you know, forefront. Um, Carrie, do you wanna forward it? Thank you. <laughs> um, forefront, um, Chicago Foundation for Women, Chicago Women in Philanthropy and Ms. Foundation for Women for allowing us to really build on this incredible work. Um, we're so, grateful for this conversation and clearly there's a lot um, more to be said. So I'll turn it over to Jackie. Great. All right, we're set, we're ready. So I, I am moved, so moved and, and fired up. And so now we, we hope you are in that same mode. We in planning this event, we're like, this is not a common list and then go away. This is a, okay, now what? We need you. We need everyone all in. So we want to have breakout rooms with the intent that you will get to be with your colleagues. We're going to do small, intimate groups. We want you to feel safe and to be direct and honest and genuine about your own experiences and to hear from others. So we're going to give you, as we said, we're going to give you prompts in the chat. Do not worry. You will have a facilitator taking care of you. They will guide you through these three questions and then they will be taking notes and we're gonna put those in a centralized document and share those out afterwards. And then there's gonna be another piece of this, which is that, okay, and then, because right, this is not just, okay, now this is like, we gotta keep moving on this. And that's the community piece of this and the intention piece of this. And Chicago Foundation for Women and Chicago Women Philanthropy are serious about this. We seek to have a sense of accountability within Chicago. We would love for this to be a model city 
look at what they've done. They've moved the number from here to here in three years or whatever it is. So we hope you are in for this mission. So let me give you a few housekeeping details. Um, you will, you will uh, pause. Your facilitators will be whisked away to a room. Hold on and you'll see a number coming up or an opportunity to join a breakout room. So when that happens, just join. If there are any people that are like, wait, nothing's happening, go down to the breakout room area, little button on the bottom and folks will take care of you. So we don't want you to worry. And then again, it's gonna be introduce yourself, your name, your organization, two questions, how can we change our practices as a sector? color and if we intend if we intend to make this change how do we hold ourselves accountable to this commitment so facilitators we invite you to join your pre-assigned breakout rooms once the rooms launch i don't know what's going on but i know it's going to happen so okay that's going to happen and then just hold on and then join your room when you're invited. And then we will come back together. Do not leave. We'll come back together next steps. Got to have that. Okay, let's go. Have fun. Okay. So that was great. I hope everyone had wonderful conversations. I know my group was very informative, got a lot of good stuff. So I just want to thank you guys for joining us today. We appreciate you sharing your time and your voice to help us begin to move the needle on this important issue. As the Pocket Change Report states, this is a call to action. Solutions come from those who are most affected by the problem. We invest in grassroots organizations and movements that center the voices and experiences of women and girls of color We protect and build upon decades of, process, of progress. This report, and you've heard it throughout the, the theme throughout this, this conversation, the report asks us to name our support for women and girls of color, track it, and ultimately increase it. Today marks the beginning of our work to shift the philanthropic landscape for women of color. Jackie. So I see Marianne put keep going. So that's what this is about now. This is the time to get moving. This is a time we hope for you to make a commitment in whatever way that means to you to take a next step. And you know, I think we all know we are up against the system but you know, as we advise our clients, systems change when one element of the system changes. And I hope and intend that this is what is happening here. So you know, I think that we are each called to see that we are more capable than we think. And that's what women do, and that's what leaders do. So, um, so we have a specific uh, opportunities for you all. You are going to get in the chat a survey, and in that you have an opportunity to opt into some next steps. Um, we will also be sending out a post-event survey, and you can you will get resources. And again, there will be an opportunity to say, "I want in. I want to opt into helping to make real change." Um, uh, before we go, I do want to say thank you to the facilitators. I want all the facilitators to put the red heart up in their little chat box so we can all see it and say thank you. Thank you, everybody. And um, we, you know, we really want and intend that this is the launching point for a movement. So please join us. We are so grateful. We are so honored and excited to be with all of you. Thank you to Chicago Foundation for Women for all our participating organizations. And we will turn it back now to Felicia. And thank you, Teresa, for the gift that you have given us that led us to today. Jackie and Deborah, um, thank you so much for coming to CFW with this idea um, and of partnership and figuring out what we could do collectively with your members. Everyone here is a member. Some, maybe some, if y'all not, you should join. All right. So your members <laughs> um, coming together because you represent a cross-section of this, you know, philanthropic industrial complex. 
Teresa Younger, I want to thank you for your leadership um, nationally and for your friendship. Um, thank you for the compelling um, research that you, you produced in this report, but also that you all reproduce all the time. If you are not familiar, um, visit Ms. Foundation because they have a lot of white papers and other resources to really help us. And for those of us who every single day um, live in the gender, we apply a gender lens to everything that we do. So at Chicago Foundation for Women and all of the other um, um, women's funds and foundations across the country, I want you to remember this. Education is not gender. Housing is not gender. Healthcare is not gender. Those things, work is not gender. And on their own, they are not. And when we apply a gender lens, when we ask the gender question, what we find are the discrepancies. What we find are places where you, now I'm talking to each one of you, those are places for you to advocate for change and to advocate for investment and to make direct investment. They're not gendered on their own, but when we look at that data and we look at the racialized gender uh, or the racialized lens and the gender lens, it tells us a different story. So these things that we need to live, these things that we all want for ourselves, right? We want for our children, we want for five generations from us today of our descendants, what we, the work that we will do together in this next, because we're, we're calling everybody in, we want to see change and we want to be able to go back to Teresa and say, girl, let me tell you what Chicago has done. As Jackie and Deborah said, we want Chicago to be a model city. We are the city of big shoulders after all. So we can do this. And it starts with all of us being accountable and think about it. We think about it every day. I think about this every day, y'all. I'm just asking you to think about it a little bit more. Apply a gender lens to it, right? Name it, track it. And together, let's increase it. And so we're looking forward to this continued partnership with uh, CWIP and the members here um, in uh, this next year and in three years. And so we're going to be sending some resources out. Um, if there are other things that you have found helpful that you think that we can share in the report out, if you send it to us, we'll get it included so we can give those resources out to everyone. So thank you for what we've heard today. Teresa, again, thank you so much. Jackie and Deborah, thank, you. thank you for your leadership and the board of CWIP. Thank you all for making this investment in your time um, for today's conversation. And I already feel it. I can already feel <laughs> that we are going to do some amazing work together. Thank you. Continue the conversation, everyone. <laughs> Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.